So today I'm joined by a returning guest. Uh, the downloads on the podcast feed and uh, views on the fa on the fascist book video prove to me that his work is in high demand, and rightfully so. Uh, I'm welcoming, welcoming back Jamin Baconic, a fellow freedom pioneer, Vanuin, and someone I would call a friend. Uh, you can find our last discussion by visiting libertyunderattack.com forward slash LAWay podcast 46, uh, or just find episode 46 on your favorite podcatcher. He's developing a lot of terrific things in the crypto anarchist realm and is doing something I plan on doing or pursuing in the next uh, couple of years permaculture farming. We'll uh, get an update on the former and dig into the latter uh, in today's discussion. So, Jamin, welcome back to the podcast, man. Uh, how are things going? All right. Um, thanks for having me back, Shane. Hey. Doing pretty good here. Hey, not a problem. Not a problem, man. So, I guess, first question, are you still rocking that, uh, with that uh, you know, Goodwill Ben, uh, you know, rock band microphone? Oh, yeah. It's, uh, it's, I'm very happy with it for the price, for sure. <laughs> you know, I, I am too. I remember when we, when you interviewed, when we, did, uh, you know, recorded that first discussion, you told me about that. I was like, oh, this is going to be this little sketchy, but he sounds good. There's no line static in his microphone. Uh, or at least it doesn't show up on the, uh, I guess, on the wavelengths, if that's the best way to put it. So I was like, oh, you know, it works. It works. And, you know, the audio came out fine. So I don't know. Maybe you should start offloading those to podcasters for like $10 a pop or something. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, that's I was collecting them. Well, um, you know, I was collecting with the idea of, you know, these neuron machines, especially the ghost pads being uh, podcast worthy. And just to have a bunch of USB mics to see how many mics I can get going and stuff like that. Right, right. <laughs> very good, very good. So, so last time we talked, you told us all about your your ghost pads and alluded to some other projects that you were working on. So let's get an update on what you're doing, starting with uh, with I guess with the ghost pads in the, in the past uh, you know few months or so. Uh, what's the uh, what's the status with those? Well, I uh, got the the next generation ones that I was talking about last time. Um, I got prototypes of those built. And I sold a couple and um, basically I've worked a couple bugs out that popped up when I did the modification and uh, now they're rock solid. I just today finally replaced my um, mobile workstation I had that was my main like desktop replacement computer with a uh, T520 ghost pad that's maxed out with a quad core processor and like uh, 16 gigs of RAM and a SSD and everything. And um, very happy with it. I have it driving two 24 inch Dell studio quality, like um, the 1920 by 1200 displays, like the little bit taller than 1080p, uh -huh. like the, that all the professional displays used to be before they, everybody decided to go with the 1080p standard because TVs used it. But um it's working pretty good, and um, I have a uh, couple special purpose machines that I don't know if we talked about them when um, we talked last, but one is uh, basically an ultra portable that is uh, based off of the you know four four or five twenty or two twenty series of um, the ghost pads. And um, I've been experimenting with using it for different things. I uh, went on vacation to the beach for a week, and I all I, I brought two ghost pads and um, put them through some tests and just saw what it was like to you you know just to have those machines and not my whole room. If you'd see the thing, I have like I don't know eight displays around me right now. So <laughs> right, right. Interesting. So, so, so I guess just to, to touch on something you mentioned there. So, so what's the difference between these new gen machines versus uh, what you were, uh, I guess, what you were, what you had for sale last time? What are some of the, the the advantages to those? Well, there's three important differences that are advantages, and one slight disadvantage. The advantages are that um, they support CPUs that can do multi-threading so the base model can run four threads at once it has a second generation i5 in it and they can also be upgraded to a four core eight thread i7 up to a third generation one so they have this you know they have double to quadruple the processing power of the fastest ghost pads based on the 500 400 and 200 series lenovo's Okay, so it's, um, so it's so, so it's the speed then. 
speed and yeah the speed then well and it's what you can do with the speed it's see that's part of the equation is the speed they um, have twice the ram capacity which is eight from eight to 16 gigs the 500 400 and 200 series has a maximum of eight gigs so basically it can have four times the processing power and twice the maximum memory and it also supports some next generation virtualization features that you need to run an operating system like cubes mm. to use it to its full effect the uh, 500 400 and 200 series like that whole generation they lack the IOMMU support that enables you to do cool stuff like I'm doing right now to talk to you using PCI pass through to a um, virtual machine. Like it can basically, you can assign slots or devices directly to the virtual machine and it really doesn't go through any type of host OS to access them. So one of the cool things you can do with that is people have been um, using GPU pass through to install a Windows virtual machine on their Linux boxes and be able to fit, play Windows games at, you know, the full frame rate, what they, you know, if they were native on a uh, bare metal machine. Wow. Okay. So, so that was, that was one of the, I guess, one of the reasons why um, I think someone like, uh, I think there's something Brian Sovereign mentioned. A lot of people have Windows machines because they still do the gaming. You know, they, they need a Windows machine to, to do the gaming. So so what you're saying is that with Linux Cubes and, and the operating, the, the oh, I guess the, the system you're running now, uh, you can run Windows, you know, Windows games, you know, fully functional on a Linux Cubes machine then. Yes, I mean, with, I mean, I haven't, um, I haven't tried it on Cubes itself, but there there are a lot of other projects that are based on the same technology Cubes uses. And um, I've read a lot of uh, forum posts of people having a really good luck with doing that. Um, the way, see, the way Cubes works is it's basically Linux on top of Zen. Zen is a what you call a hypervisor, and it's basically, you know, you're your operating system kernel you could think of the supervisor of your operating system well this is super this kind of supersedes and supervises all the operating system kernels of the virtual machines you're running so basically it is installed onto the bare metal machine and then everything else is installed on top um, so one of the products i plan on coming out with will be able to be, do the gpu pass through um, and it will probably be based on cubes since cubes is already all put together. I just haven't had, um, you know, that's that's something that needs a lot more testing and R and D on my part. But you know, there's a lot of, uh, I mean, if you look for GPU pass through, for let's say like the Q QEMU emulator or virtual machine virtual machine um, player, that you'll see people having luck with even that one. So this mm -hmm. is even lower level. Interesting, interesting. So, so just one note for the listeners, real quick, and it's probably something I should have mentioned in the in the introduction, but it, it should have been should have been very clear. This is gonna be a very tech heavy podcast, um, but uh, you know, crypto anarchism. I, I really do think, and I've said this many times before. Uh, you know, folks like Jamin are the ones that are going to really be pioneering these technologies. You know, uh, in furtherance of of privacy. Uh, you know, when it comes to cryptocurrencies and, uh, and encryption, all of those great things. So uh, very tech heavy podcast, but very, very necessary. And uh, once you see once you hear more about uh, the stuff that he's working on, uh, I think you'll, you'll understand the uh, if you don't already, you'll understand the the uh, the the significance of uh, of what he's doing. So uh, so uh, some of the stuff is over my head, too, guys. But uh, at the same time, you know, I, I think Jamin, uh, Jamin explains these things uh, very, very well. So uh, sorry to, to jump in there for a moment, but uh, if you want to continue with what you're saying. Oh, no, saying. that's no problem. So basically, you know, I, I have that in the works, and that's part of a, a larger a larger project. I've, ta I've talked about um, the device for um, VPN and Tor routing and kind of shielding you from your ISP's hardware probably last time. Well... I am actually planning a line of devices like that, accumulating with one that can act as a set um, a home theater PC and gaming system. Mm. So it would basically be a personal cloud server that did all your security and um, was completely compartmentalized through either cubes or the same scheme cubes uses with um, 
you know, Steam running using GPU pass through to a decent graphics card. So the uh, and the low end of that line would be a small single board computer in a uh, custom little 3D printed box that you could simply use for um, the all the basic functions of uh, of a Freedom Box. Okay, interesting. Which we can get into. Yeah, yeah. Let's 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 do that. So so I guess uh, uh, for for those I, I watched. Uh, I watched one, when we were talking about, you know, preparing for this episode, or when we were preparing for this episode, you, I watched a, a short video on it. Um, so I kind of have a little bit of an idea, but but what is a what is a freedom box, and I guess what significance would that have to to folks that are, you know, freedom oriented and and you know, care about privacy? Well, basically, freedom box is a project that's been going on since maybe, uh, oh man, I want to say maybe two thousand eight or something. Um, and what it does and what it's aimed to do is be a low, um, a very inexpensive piece of hardware that will allow you to um, route all your network traffic to, you know, through your internet service. It'll, it will allow you to route that through either Tor or a VPN. And it will have basically like enterprise grade functions on it that are scaled down for personal use. Like it's a, it has a personal cloud file server. So you don't have to put your data on, you know, Google's cloud or Amazon's cloud or any of these cloud services out there that are basically, you know, going to sell you out as soon as they get an opportunity. Well, or they, 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 they already are. I mean, or, or they, you know, they are, oh, they, yeah, already, yeah. they already do, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, I mean, to, you know, kind of gain back that autonomy and still have the convenience of being able to access your files from anywhere. Well, this, this would be working on its own encrypted VPN that you would only have the keys to. Right. So, so, so what, so what you're, so what you're talking about here then is essentially, um, and I remember, I remember that in that video, it was, just, it was just a small little box. So this would be a way to route your general internet traffic through, through your, uh, your modem and your router through this box um, so that it's uh, run through a VPN or Tor, uh, and then on top of that, this little this little box would also be a personal cloud server. Yes. Wow. Um, and it can also, I mean, depending on the hardware it's run on, um, there are a lot of functions you can add to it, and it's really like uh, use use your imagination what a general purpose computer can do. So you could have your own surveillance on it, um, depending on the hardware you're using. Um, you can, uh, like I said, do all the other things I was talking about, like home theater PC and gaming and everything else, depending on the hardware of this machine. But the low end ones will be able to do those basic functions. And what's really cool is there are a lot of people working on adding functions to this, um, this, uh, you know, idea, this freedom box project. And, um, some of those functions are things like mesh networking. So the the plan and the strategy is to rely on the fast connections we have now, but at the same time, the developers of the, and people around the project and doing similar things, they're all figuring out ways around internet blockages and internet kill switches and um, censorship and whatnot. So what, like once somebody would have this hardware, software features would be free you know added software features would be free and just from an update versus like you know the uh closed source model they lock everything up and you have to pay for each key to each function mm -hmm. well i mean these machines would be able to you know get get new functions as the apps are developed and matured Interesting, interesting. Yeah, so 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 that kind of so the freedom box then ties into the mesh networking. So so the I guess the the, the idea now is is privacy. You know, still using the the uh, the first realm uh, internet, uh, the first realm infrastructure, and uh, you know focusing on privacy. And the next step then would be to uh, you know if there if there was such a thing as it, or I guess if if there was ever a time when the internet was shut off, these little boxes could be. Um, you know, used as, as mesh networking. And I guess, first off, I think we might have defined this before, but but what's the idea of mesh networking? Uh, what's kind of a, a way to explain that? Well, 
mesh networking eliminates centralized points of failure. The way things work now are you have routers and you have clients. And basically you have, let's see how to explain it. Um, okay, you have all these clients and they need this access to the central gateway router in order to go anywhere. Well, if that centralized gateway router is taken offline for whatever reason, they can't get out of the local network that they're in. Mm -hmm. Now, a mesh network, it doesn't have to be every node, but lots of nodes on the network are also a gateway. And there are algorithms that will route the data intelligently through those gateways. And once, if one disappears, they will intelligently self-heal the network and route around it. So it's just eliminates the, uh, you know, the, the centralized points of failure that you have with a network topology that relies on routers that only route to get you places. So, I mean, that's probably the easiest way I can explain it. So, so what, and, uh, uh, what it's meant, sorry to jump in again. So, so for, for those that understand, for those who understand cryptocurrencies, uh, would this be, would this be similar? And I guess a way for them to conceptualize this, uh, you know, uh, where, where, uh, like, uh, with, with the blockchain, um, you know, if, uh, there's, there's no way for it to, 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 it's, it's immutable, right? Um, you know, the Bitcoin blockchain is immutable, you, you know, transactions can't be, you know, erased or manipulated. Uh, so would this be kind of similar where, uh, you know, even just, uh, where, where the, the blockchain is stored on the individual kind of wallets when they just kind of update, like there's no way to actually take down the blockchain. Is that kind of the kind of similar only related to the, the more, the more broad internet? Yeah, sure. I mean, you're, you're limited to the physical infrastructure that these um, mesh nodes are running on. But I mean, it it's much harder to take the network down if it's in a mesh configuration. But there's, I mean, there's a lot of caveats to mesh networking um, being that devices and nodes are going to come and go. Um, the type of, uh, you know, there's not, there can't be like a heavy, heavy security on who joins the network um, for it to be kind of like very, very, uh, a very widely used network with an, a lot of coverage. The more restrictions you put on devices joining, the less devices will join. Mm -hmm. Just stuff like that. Um, but, you know, you, the, the workaround to that is to do your security on higher levels. And, um, you know, basically instead of doing security, like for instance, regular wireless, you know, most people are using WPA2 and, um, that does security on that level. And this would be a level above that, that where the security be done. Okay. So. Interesting. Interesting. So, so as far as, uh, so, so as far as, uh, what, what you're working on with mesh networking, it seems like the freedom boxes uh are, are are very much kind of overlapping here uh i mean what what specifically are you working on and what can the uh what can the listeners look forward to and, and i mean is there anything they can purchase now uh, in this uh in this uh realm no i'm trying to um save up for some r d funds for this project i have um i have some development boards picked out i was all set on using a raspberry pi until i did a bunch of research on how secure they are and um, they're not really, you know, for a project like this, they're not the right device. They have a lot of issues. They have a lot of firmware blobs that you can't look at. And there's mm. a lot of closed source stuff going on in them. So unfortunately, they are very inexpensive for the power they have. And um, the open source versions, uh, you know, open source development boards that actually have open source hardware are... Um, not quite as uh, featureful as far as as much as far as when it comes to uh, like processing power and memory sometimes, but they um, they definitely have enough to do this job. Like one of the boards I'm looking at is called an Olinux Eno A20, and um, it has two one gigahertz ARM ARM processor cores on it. And like, I think 512 megs of RAM and it has some cool, 
things that Andrew, that the uh, Pi doesn't have, like gigabit gigabit Ethernet, and um, it, it can actually accept a SATA hard drive hmm. or a SATA SSD, just like a uh, desktop or laptop computer. And um, I believe it has USB three on it too. So I mean, it has a lot more I/O options as far as like high speed interfaces to connect it to stuff and build things out of it. But it has half the processing power of a Pi three, let's say. Hmm, okay. But it's still it's still more than enough to do these basic functions. Um, now this this stuff really isn't very new. I mean, people, there have been Linux distributions out there years ago that were, you know, centered around turning a desktop into a router like this, not with Tor, but you could do, you know, VPN and stuff with them. And, you know, that's kind of one of the things I got into Linux with is uh, using those uh, turnkey router distributions to, to turn like old Pentium ones into like a network device. So this is a, you know, this is just doing the same thing on these little development boards now that I was doing 15 years ago on like full size hardware. So, so, so it's been, it's been something discussed and worked on for some time. Uh, I mean, how, obviously for, for, I, I really do think for, for, for these technologies, uh, especially for something like mesh networking or, uh, you know, things along those lines, they, they kind of require upon, you know, uh, people to adopt these technologies. So, so I guess uh, a two-part question here. Uh, I guess how how much is the how much progress has been made? You know, in the past, you know, 15 years uh, since you've been working on them. And second off, I mean, how 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 close are we to uh, these being available to the average individual? Well, really, the most of the progress comes in the form of energy savings, um, small size. Um, you know, power for per watt and um, just, a, a, I don't know, a market that's ready for them, kind of. As far as the mesh networking goes, I wasn't really doing much mesh networking. That was, you know, most of the stuff at that point was wired that I was doing. But um, there's been a lot of development in mesh networking technology. There are multiple there are multiple um, router schemes, um, like router algorithms that are competing for, you know, what, what's going to be the best one right now. There are a lot of uh, commercial offerings that are fairly expensive of good working mesh implementations. There is a, a lot of interest in it in the open source community for the reasons I was talking about. Right. Um, so... I mean, it, it is coming along pretty quickly. There, there's a really uh, decent project out there now that is will be separate from this, but um, it's called Broadband Hamnet, and basically, it's an it's a mesh network that uh, was created by a bunch of uh, ham hackers, the people that are into radio and and computers simultaneously, that type of stuff. And um, it's it uses WRT routers, um, like a, actually I think it's just like the Linksys WRT54G router, a certain revision or a certain comp. You know, there's like a handful of revisions you can use, but it's a functioning mesh network right now. That if you fire one up, and there is if there's another node within range of it, it'll discover that node, and you'll be hooked up. Wow. So, I mean, there's a lot, yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on. And I also, you know, I have a, um, a big box of those routers specifically to start messing around with that too. Um, but that's very specific, but it's good because, um, those routers are very inexpensive. They don't take a lot of power. Um, they're, there's so much DIY stuff out there for making like waterproof cases and like solar panels and like all these things that you would need for a system like this that, um, 
and there, there are still so many around as well. Right, and and that's 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 really that's really really positive to hear because I I'll, I'll t- I mean, the listeners might be surprised to hear this. Maybe I've alluded to it in previous podcasts, but I used to be kind of the sailboat guy. Like my my dream was uh, my dream and what I was you know working towards was uh, minimal sailboating. You know I want to get on a boat and just you know float around international waters you know without government. Um, but they're like that's that's a lot harder to do than say van nomadism. So I've been looking a lot into uh, you know like van conversions uh, where you can yeah. get have them be completely self sufficient and uh, like it <laughs> and it, it's very very feasible. And I can only imagine like I guess just just ponder this for a moment uh, for the uh, for for those listening. Imagine just like a, a van nomadic. Just a, I guess uh, you know a lot of uh, you know Venuans take to van nomadism because it is it is pretty easy and it's cheap to do. Uh, it, it really is. It really is. But consider, you know, kind of like a uh, <laughs> a mesh network of uh, of van nomads, uh, you know, roaming around the United States. Like I, that's just really incredible. That's really cr- like a it's a really crazy thought, but but one that you know I, I wouldn't mind seeing that uh, you know happen in the future. So as far as uh, these things being uh, you know I guess energy efficient, uh, it, it really wouldn't it really wouldn't be hard, especially with the uh, the affordability of, of uh, you know, solar panels with with as much power as you would need for, you know, a van uh, with all the things you would need, it really wouldn't take that much. So I, I think that's positive that uh, these things are becoming more energy efficient. Oh, yeah. Like one of these things, maximum power consumption is maybe 12 watts. So, right. it's, you know, a very cheap solar panel can provide that with a small battery for um, when the sun isn't shining. I mean, that's that's very, very little. I mean that's like less than a suit, like a very high powered flashlight, you know. <laughs> right, um, right. So, so I guess um, I don't know how how would like I, I'm thinking I'm thinking of things as we're as we're talking here. So how would like would there be like a is could there be a mobile mesh network like through you know a bunch of van nomads like would that be possible? Yeah, and I'm actually um, actually experimenting with some of that stuff. I have a uh, I have a Ram twenty five hundred like quad cab with a pop-up truck camper on it with 150 watts of solar, a couple hundred amp hours of battery. And um, it's basically my test bed for exactly what you're talking about. Did you have this set up at the Midwest Peace and Liberty Fest? Yes. Damn it. I want to, I should have taken the time to check it out, man. Yeah, I've been, I've been working. We we're looking for a truck camper forever. You know, this is, been something I wouldn't do for a long time. And then we found one, you know, the proverbial side of the road with the for sale sign on it really cheap and, um, brought it home, used it as is for a couple, you know, camp outs. And then I went and started tearing out stuff that was rotten and replacing it. And, um, I installed the solar system and replaced all the lights with led lights, you know, just stuff like that. But it's with that, it's like a 150 watt panel. And when I get my, uh, I'm going to make a, a switch that I can jack the truck battery into that system too. And, you know, switch it on and off, but it'll be like 250 amp hours of battery capacity and vacation this year. We, uh, we used it on the beach and it was basically enough to power, you know, all the cell phones and stuff. Um, two laptops a uh i i put a like 22 inch monitor in there with a raspberry pi with cody on it for an entertainment center right it was a power that like and the battery capacity never went down you know like below uh maybe 80 percent or something um so yeah it's it's not that expensive to do that i think the solar panel was maybe 130 dollars shipped for 150 wow. watt and see I was, um, I was i was putting together i was i was watching these van conversion videos on on youtube and i didn't think we'd get into this tonight but i'm enjoying it uh i, I was watching like they they got you know maybe like a seventy five hundred dollars on a van i mean it was it like they, they i i know what they did and they, they they wanted you know kind of the the bones to be good you know they wanted a, a you know a, a deep like a, a good engine they wouldn't have to worry about for a while and then they just stripped out uh the entire you know back end of that and spent five hundred dollars on materials, and uh, I'll tell you what—it's a lot more. I mean, it's 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 it looks slick, it's uh, functional, 
And uh, it's a lot better than uh, back in the 60s when Ray was talking. He's like, you know, if it, you can't say that that Vonnie living is expensive, just buy a bed, bed truck and toss a mattress in the back. And that would be unattractive to a lot of folks. But you can, you can, I mean, you yeah. can live, uh, I guess, uh, uh, you know, obviously very frugally in a, a nice living space uh, in, in the back of a van. And, and I was looking at, you know, okay, so solar panels, I mean, how much would this cost? And I guess I was way out of the range here. Uh, but I was, like the price I was coming up with on Amazon were like a thousand bucks. So so maybe it would be even cheaper. Maybe you do it for under uh, like if, if someone did want to go that route and buy like a used like 2007 or 2008, I guess, kind of work van uh, for, you know, five to seventy five hundred dollars. Uh, maybe they could maybe, you know, the rest of it could be outfitted for, you know, less than 10 grand. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, let me think how much I have into my solar system. I would say I have. 150 or 160 into the battery have like 140 some or maybe 150 including the actual mounts like the brackets to mount it to the roof into the panel then i probably have like 30 bucks in the cabling or and um the charge controller i think was like 25 dollars for one that will take two more of those panels if i wanted to add to it so really not that much Right. Yeah. No. That's... Now, I don't have an inver- I, I don't have a dedicated inverter in the system because I'm aiming to use mostly DC, you know, DC powered things. Mm-hmm. And with the ghost pads, I I have an option that you can get a power supply that runs either off a 12 volt DC or line voltage. Okay. So they plug right into an alternative energy system. That's... Without you using that, uh, you lose so much converting from AC to DC. Yeah, fifteen percent inverter loss or something like that. So it's all about efficiency. So you don't need as big of a system. Okay, so 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 uh, for 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 any uh, you know future van nomads out there, you could you could run a ghost pad and your uh, you could run multiple ghost pads in your uh, in your uh, in your van. Uh, you know the the option for for mobile mesh networking, and I want to get to that here in a moment. I mean, so 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 potentially you could have that as well. I mean, this sounds like a really incredible second realm. Uh, and 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 as Rayo kind of favored, and I'm, I kind of t- I tend to lean in his favor, or lean in, lean, yeah, lean in his favor that you know mobility is absolutely crucial. So, uh, you know what the coercers can't find if the coercers can't find you, they can't coerce you. So, uh, I mean, this this is all sounding uh, really, really interesting. Um, so, I guess let's I guess mobile mesh networking. I mean, how how it, and and you kind of answered a little bit as far as uh, like that that that's kind of your testing bed. But uh, I mean, is that uh, extremely feasible? Like, could there be like a mobile mesh network rather than having to be uh, like with the the first realm infrastructure with you know having to have that uh, that modem you know hardwired into the uh, into the cable. Uh, at least that's how it is for me. Um, I guess, uh, would that be possible? Yes, eventually. I mean, it's going to take a lot of people doing it. I mean, you just, just think of, um, the line of sight, your, excuse me, your wireless radio has for transmit. And there has to be someone in that line of sight that is doing it too. Right. Um, but I mean, there's there are a lot of other ways to get um, network access that aren't as uh, above board, though, as well. Interesting. You want to speak? You want to speak to those opportunities? Just, just I'm, I'm I'm curious. <laughs> are you familiar with war driving at all? War driving. Can't say I've. I've I can't say I am. Okay. Basically, it's um, you're recording recording wireless access points and their GPS coordinates. So all you do is you like, and the ghost pads are set up to be able to do this, is that you run this application that is monitoring Wi-Fi, and then it's spitting out that data to another application that is uh, recording the GPS coordinates and all the other stuff, all the details about the connections you find in a file. So... You know, kind of like how Google drives around to make the street maps in their cars. Well, people have been doing the same thing, mapping out wireless networks. And um, there's, you know, there's always ones that are open or ones that have weak security or ones that are just public. (laughs) Right. Um, So, I mean, that's been a thing for a long time. And that that type of stuff is probably going to have a um, 
resurgence because of the uh, crack vulnerability that was just discovered on WPA2. Huh. I wasn't. I wasn't familiar. I mean, there's so many. So many of the things. So many of these things happen. You know, every single day with this terrible security, uh, or maybe just uh, maybe outdated. Maybe something better is, is, is needs to needs to come out if it's not already. But but what happened? What happened with that? Well, basically, um, someone found a vulnerability that they can force it to use an old key. Um, let's see how I can boil it down a little more understandable. Okay, in the past, the way you would attack a Wi-Fi network is that you would have to try to give try to get the key. All right, you would monitor the network, and um, there's this negotiation that takes place when a client jumps on the network. It's called the four-way handshake. And if you recapture that and record it, you can take that to an offline cracking program and it will use a dictionary attack or use all sorts of ways you can do it. But usually um, people use a a dictionary attack to use the clues that are in that four-way handshake to figure out what the encryption, what the, you know, the uh, Wi-Fi key is. So this, you know, and then, you know, they'd find the key, they'd get on your network or they'd make themselves a, an evil twin. They would, you know, they would basically be, instead of your network you're connecting to, you'd be connecting to them and they'd be forwarding your information wherever, but they would be recording it and stripping out the encryption uh, like yeah. the SSL. Um, but this vulnerability, it allows somebody to attack the clients and basically decrypt a lot of what the clients are sending out that is supposed to be, you know, heavily encrypted through WPA2. And it's basically an attack that makes, um, makes them be able to insert an encryption key. And basically it can, I believe it can even like make a zero key that like just says the keys all zeros. It's it's hard to explain. Um, but there's there's a significant vulnerability, and, and this is um, and the, yeah, this is something that would affect anyone that uses a WPA2. If if someone is trying to if if someone's trying to you know I guess uh, get into their system. So um, I, I guess uh, what what's I, I'm always curious to see what the the I guess the manufacturers or I guess kind of the the tech world's response to these sorts of things. I mean, were, did they uh, you know jump on it real quick and fix the vulnerability i mean what, what's kind of been the progress with that if you if you're if you if you know well well all the all the uh all the big names did they jumped on it they actually were notified before the vulnerability was released to the public so they had been working on patches and stuff like that so most of the major major companies with devices have patched things or have a patch available but the problem is now we were talking about the Internet of Attack Vectors. A lot of those devices are never going to get patched. So a lot of those devices are now insecure, even though they're using WPA2. So they're insecure nodes on your network that can be launching off points for other attacks once they're compromised. Okay, and, and to, to try to, I guess, maybe see if I, if I understand this and, and to put it in, in other words for the listeners... So, so for the, these various the, these various attack vectors, so so like the, the major companies where you know this WPA2 encryption for these for these routers and modems, if I'm understanding this correctly, um, you know they got all that patched and that's that's you know that that's good, uh, at least for the major ones. But for um, I guess the Internet of Things devices, those are insecure nodes now uh, that could be exploited uh, through it, it could be you know I guess exploited for uh, you know f- uh, for for security leaks or something. Is that kind of what what you're talking about here? Sure, and there there are a lot of um, a lot of devices from the manufacturers that have, have released patches that are just not supported anymore. So that makes it even worse. Yeah. So you have all these devices that don't have any support because they were closed source to begin with, and you were you know you're stuck with that manufacturer to do anything with them. You have the devices that are just cheap imported stuff 
that are like no brand name or the they're the generic things that everybody slaps their own brand name onto well those companies aren't going to patch them you know f for the most part um and uh, you have things like phones and a lot of those things aren't going to get patched properly especially if they're old not out, out of date yeah. and run an unsupported version of android or whatever so you know, you have all those old devices. It just made a bunch of old devices even more of a security risk. <sighs> yeah, yeah. So, so, so I guess the, the the answer to this problem is uh, is open source, right? Where where people can, uh, you know, and, and that that's one thing I, I I I really I really like about the open source. And I can't think of any examples off the top of my head, but there there have been, you know, you know, uh, you know, issues raised with various open source programs and. They get taken care of pretty quickly, if not by the original developer. Uh, it's open source, so other people can do it. Uh, it's it's not uh, uh, so even if something is you know five years old, uh, some sort of program is five years old, those still get patched. Uh, and actually, I think I remember. I don't know if I don't know if this is actually open source. I'm not going to mention it, but uh, but yeah, I guess the answer to that would be open source, right? Yeah, I mean. It, it all depends on how much demand for the program to exist, too. There's a lot of open source projects that fizzle out and are no longer supported, too. But the thing with those projects is if you want, if you really want it supported, you could put money behind it and, you know, do a Kickstarter to get it up again if there's enough interest in it. And, have to, you know, if you can't code, you can have developers just, you know, okay, take this source code and update it. You know, make it new again. So you can't do that with a closed source you know, solution. Right, right. So, so we're, we're about 45 minutes into this. And we haven't even gotten to the second portion, but I, I do want to get into, um, I guess one, one, I, I guess. Okay. So, so moving into permaculture here, you mentioned two other things, uh, when we were, when we were preparing for this, um, and th yeah, this is in, in regards to your developing your crypto anarchist work, which I found interesting, you know, alongside these other things, like you have freedom boxes and mesh networking, and then you have a weather station and irrigation automation and monitoring. So, tell us a bit about what you're what you're trying to do there, and obviously that re that re that relates to to what you're doing out there on your permaculture farm. Well, the uh, weather station stuff, it you know there are turnkey um, pie hats they they call them. They're basically boards that you know jack right onto the pie, and any other compatible with the same pinout. Like a lot of these development boards have the same pinout on their expansion header so they can use Pi compatible stuff and you don't have to use a Pi. But um, yeah, there's there's a bunch of mature product products out there and projects to just be able to roll your own weather station up. And, um, you know, you can either jack it into like a national database and or you can use it for, um, you know, my my wanting what i want to do with it is i want to use it for um site analysis so you can have a weather station there you can put it there for a year and you can graph what's going on there as far as the weather the you know the barometric pressure the temperature the wind speed the wind direction i mean there's even things that can measure sunlight and you know stuff like that so it's uh, get into some of the um, you know permaculture uh, principles and um, techniques. Like that's that's a big thing. It's just observation, and this can automate a lot of that observation and be more detailed than just kind of uh, eyeballing it. Right, right, yeah. That's so, that's. Yeah, I mean, obviously, yeah. What's uh, you know what's going on with the environment and the. Uh, uh, and the weather obviously has a major impact on uh, on you know what what you might decide to grow next year if or, or uh, you know uh, you know what you'll have to do to to make something uh, you know grow the following year. So yeah, that 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 certainly makes sense. And and I suppose the irrigation, automation, and monitoring would, um, in some sense. So 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 kind of just just thinking thinking this through, um, maybe your end goal is. Uh, have that weather station feeding in constant information to the irrigation system that you have, maybe, you know, kind of uh, something that you rigged up so that uh, if uh, the weather station, you know, detects for uh, there's been no rain for three days, there's not going to be rain for three more days, uh, you know, go ahead and feed some water to these plants. Is that kind of what you're thinking? Well, basically it can work off of um, moisture sensors for the irrigation part. 
um, you could totally do what you're doing, what you're talking about too, but um, drip your drip irrigation with con that's controlled by uh, sensors like moisture sensors in the soil where the, you know, where, where the plants are is more what I was thinking for the irrigation control. And there's all, like, you know, I'm not reinventing the wheel here. I'm, I'm building a car out of wheels that are already there. So like right. it would be, you know, th these devices, um, there's no reason why it has to be just a weather station. It can also be, you know, it can also be a drip, you know, drip irrigation um, automation system as well, running on the same box. Um, just like uh, it could also be a mesh network node at the same time. Okay, so we're talking about kind of the same. You you could you could have uh, one of these uh, and and just say freedom boxes that could be running your mesh networking, or it could be you know just kind of your your VPN from your normal you know your normal modem or router, and it could also be your your weather station or irrigation controller or something along those lines. Wow. Okay. Yeah, and the weather stations that, um, you know, um, these are machines that are made to be outside, solar powered, battery backup, waterproof c cases up on poles, basically. Um, so, you know, that that's also kind of my idea for uh, making mesh nodes. So if each one of those is a mesh node, um, you just have that much, you know, that much greater chance of having a working mesh with more nodes basically right right so so, so i guess a question there for I, i'm starting to understand what how this how this these these mesh nodes would work um i guess how much would how much would they cost for for the average individual and could they come equipped with the the hardware to run a mesh node already as far as the hardware needed to run the mesh node i mean it's you know basically going to be a wireless radio um most a lot of these development boards do have integrated wireless, but that's not really what we're looking for because it has a very limited range and very limited tweakability. Um, but adding mesh network capability to a, a, a box that's already doing stuff is as simple as buying a USB wireless adapter of the right type and the and proper antenna for it. Okay. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. And, and I guess how much? How much? How, do you have any idea on how much that would cost? Like, if I if I was going to do this tomorrow, how much? How much would that cost me? Um. Now, based on the pie, which is what I was doing all my research around before I decided to use something else. Sure. You, you know, the you usually pay about fifty dollars for a pie in a case. Um. <laughs> Um, I forget how much the uh, weather station hats are, but I mean, the goal would be as inexpensive as possible, you know, under a couple hundred dollars, it's, uh, is attainable. Um, when we're talking about the radio needed for the mesh network, you know, it's, it's a $25 part with a, you know, 20, $20 antenna. So. Sure. You know, it's just, uh, it's really hard to say. I haven't really priced that stuff out because that's more in the future. Um, right now, I want to get the the basic Freedom Box things going and um, in people's hands. And I have a uh, another another place, another site that uh, I have friends doing permaculture farming, and they're very much into all this stuff too. And um, between my site and their site for testing, I want to hook them up and help them get started with monitoring and everything else. And of course, I mean, these could have surveillance cameras on them as well. I mean, it's a general purpose computer. It can do whatever you want. Right, right. Yeah, and I, I think, and that's, and I'm, I'm still trying to wrap my head around this, as I'm sure you can imagine, being a, uh, um, not a tech illiterate, but at the same time, I mean, this is, this is, I've been looking into this for almost two years now, and it's still, there's, there's so much there, especially for someone not, pro, like not a programmer, or developer, or hardware hacker as yourself, but, I mean, it doesn't seem impossible that, you know, once, once kind of, once things get ironed out with, you know, the mesh node specifically, um, you know, have some sort of a, uh, you know, start pushing that out, uh, like all hell. 
and uh, maybe you know run some some Kickstarters or go go fund me's and uh, you know get get a bunch of these purchased and then just send them out to people that would be would be willing to actually get them hooked up. I don't know how many how much I don't know how like how how much the demand is for that now, but I can't I can I can certainly see uh, a lot more uh, a lot more folks in the anarchist community starting to care about privacy. So. Uh, and obviously decentralization too. I mean, that's kind of been the thing with cryptocurrencies for a while. So I, I, I do think this has the legs to be something really, really incredible. So, um, I mean, that's seriously, seriously positive. I mean, that that's I, and I guess one other question here that I thought of a moment ago, and uh, I, I hope you have some time to my chain. But I, I didn't expect to talk about this for for will probably be an hour by the time this is all said and done. But um, oh man, I'm I'm fine. The kids are watching a show with. Their mom. Okay, good deal. It's all good. Good deal. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I obviously don't, want to, you know, impinge upon uh, uh, anything going on, going on there at home. But so, so as far as, uh, I guess one, one argument made against cryptocurrencies, and I think it's, it's, it's a, it's, it's something that does need to be, you know, pondered, and a solution needs to be, to be offered, or multiple solutions, you know, is this kind of sort of the free market, but. If the government, if, if there's, if the internet, if there's, you know, an internet kill switch, you know, in, in some countries where, you know, the, the governments have shut off the internet, um, you know, cryptocurrencies aren't going to have, aren't going to have much of effect there. Uh, so could kind of the mesh networking take over for, like, could it handle the blockchain uh, technology as well? I mean, is there any, any sort of development, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, combining, you know, mesh networking and kind of these uh, freedom boxes with uh, blockchain? Well, the, the, uh, um, the networking projects that I'm aware of that combine a blockchain with networking have been like um, like Namecoin, that was uh, you know a blockchain based DNS system. Right, right, yeah. So there, that's I mean that's really important. I mean you can have all these all these network nodes in a network, but if they don't know what nodes what, and we're you know they don't have any type of naming convention or anything to organize them, and that's right now that's basically centrally managed. And that's another that's another area that needs to be you know turned over to the second realm and there's there's a lot of stuff that is uh working around that so yeah i'm sure the uh a blockchain could be propagated by mesh network i don't know exactly how that would work it'd be very very difficult i mean it would have to have something that's very widespread adoption and big enough to route around the blockages but um it's you know it's definitely something that's possible right yeah i mean that is uh, you know when if if the lights ever go out you know crypto is probably not the best thing to have everything and you should be divested in other stuff too of course of course yeah 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 um yeah and there was uh, i'm trying to remember exactly what it was uh it was uh, on the bitcoin blockchain um, it was uh, so. So Michael Michael uh, Fien did a lot of he he were he did some work with Namecoin and and you know that kind of uh, you know I guess that that project kind of failed to some extent and uh, he tried to do something with uh, I'm, I can't remember uh, Bitcoin is the cryptocurrency bit B I P is in Paul uh, Bitcoin and then oh why why don't I um, why can't I remember this but it was it was uh, you know kind of that same Namecoin idea based off of the Bitcoin blockchain. Unfortunately, it didn't. Unfortunately, that you know that apparently there wasn't that much of a demand for it at this point, and that that and that's, that's something too. I, I I was talking to Kyle on a recent episode of the Vonnie podcast. And we were talking about, um, actually no, it was it was here on Liberty Under Attack. God, I'm getting these things confused now. Um, uh, but uh, as I was talking about uh, how you know we've got, I mean we've got uh, we've got Monero, you know we've we've got these crypto note coins with uh and with you know these anonymous blockchains. I mean, why the hell isn't there a an assassination market yet? And I'm getting ahead of myself. This technology hasn't been around for that long. I mean, e even when we're talking about mesh networking, I mean, probably no more than 20 years. And, and maybe I'm wrong about about that, but that's still not a lot of time, and a lot of developments have been made, even just the past 10 years when it comes to crypto anarchism. So I, I think I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here. And since I don't know how difficult it is to, uh, you know, program or develop. Uh, well, I know it's difficult, but I, I, I'm not in, in, in their shoes, so I, I don't have a firsthand experience of that. And then also, too, there are simpler problems that need to be tackled first. So simpler and easier problems that need to be tackled first using, you know, blockchain technology and other things. So I think sometimes I'm getting ahead of myself here. I'm seeing the potential for all of these technologies. And these things take time, right? Good things take time. Yeah, and I mean, the fundamental thing right now 
is to support open source when you can and to try to transition everything you're using to open source as much as possible because that's going to give it some momentum and um you know you're just stoking the forces of the market when you do that um but yeah you know there's all these projects that are right on the cusp of cusp of being being uh viable and it's just a matter of people trying them and using them to uh you know give them the tests they need Because that's really the issue that we're dealing with, with these, you know, ghost phones, ghost pads, whatever, is that there's no way that you can organize with, with other people and have these distributed tribes if you have a snitch in your pocket all the time. Mm -hmm. People are literally wearing wires all the time. They have a snitch in their pocket and they're trying to do clandestine things. That's never going to work. You know, I'm focused on this project now because I really see how the unfettered flow of communication is what really has prompted this, you know, shift in consciousness. And that if this does, if this can't continue this way and people can't communicate freely with each other, then all the dis distributed networks that have formed um, aren't going to be very effective and they're not going to, uh, they're not going to be able to do what they could do. Um, if you can't communicate, especially when you're basically part of a dispersed tribe at this point, if you can't communicate without being monitored, it basically hamstrings anything, you know, anything going forward. Step up your privacy and order a ghost phone today. Just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash ghost phone. Again, libertyunderattack.com forward slash ghost phone. And make sure to keep a lookout for more ghost pads, privacy tools, freedom boxes, and more. LibertyUnderAttack.com is the website. Liberty Under Attack Publications. Share your story. Find your freedom. The second volume in the Brushfire Thriller series takes place in the not-so-distant future. In the second half of the 21st century, the War of Ideas took place. The creation of Second Realms and individualist decentralized freedom cells spread across geographical regions, and the practical ideas of liberty, voluntary interaction, and peace took hold. The Free Society in 2048 is loosely based on Samuel E. Konkin III's Phases of Agorism, in which the destruction of the state would be realistically accomplished for the establishment of pockets of free individuals, black and gray markets, and the spreading of the ideas of freedom and liberty, until the demand for an overarching state was no longer perceived as essential, and individualism and voluntary interaction prevailed. The original creators of the freedom cells who led the world to a better place are still scattered about living their lives, including Maxine, the late Henry Tucker's love, and the now washed up but stubborn punk rocker Warren, still reside in the Appalachian Mountains. Maxine's nephew, Vince, and his boy Tommy, who had been band nomads ever since Tommy's mom left to pursue a materialistic quest for fortune in the never-ending rat race, went to visit Auntie Max on her homestead on Jim Mountain Road. Although Max is very happy for the visit, she has an ulterior motive. Her close friend she met during her revolutionary days, Isaac Hopper, is trapped in a geographical area previously known as New York City, now known as the State Zone. The State Zone is one of only a handful of remnant states where an overarching power-hungry government rules over its citizens with aggressive force. Together, Warren, Vince, and Tommy team up and use their knowledge, including advanced hacking techniques, low-tech ciphers, IRC encrypted chat, and cryptocurrencies to infiltrate and evade the authorities in the state zone and bring back Isaac to freedom. But their mission, the rescue of Isaac, Auntie Max's close friend and confidant, isn't going to be easy. 
They are up against a powerful authoritarian Hydra state, a massive surveillance apparatus, a relentless and murderous police state, and a propaganda arm that will not stop until extremist terrorists known as the TRIO, Warren, Vince, and Tommy are brought to justice. Will the TRIO pull off the rescue of Max's longtime friend, Isaac Hopper? Will the forces of good, free individuals, prevail against the safest forces of evil? Find out in the second volume of the Brushfire Thriller series, 2048, available exclusively via Libertarian Attack Publications. Just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash 2048. Again, libertyunderattack.com forward slash 2048, or snag them both in the Brushfire bundle. libertyunderattack.com forward slash 2048 bundle. Libertarian Attack Publications. Share your story. Find your freedom.